They're talking about the rights of the accused with the fourth um, amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Four through eight are usually known as the rights of the accused. If you ever find yourself accused of a crime someday, these are the amendments that can protect you from a lot of things that government wants to do to you. So we're going to continue talking about these rights of the accused with the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. The Fifth Amendment guarantees multiple rights, uh, including um, no double jeopardy and the right to due process, which is a very important right because it makes government, it compels government to afford you all these liberties that we've been talking about. But today we're going to start out with the Fifth Amendment's guarantee um, of the right to remain silent or the right or freedom from self-incrimination government cannot force you to testify against yourself. If you are accused of a crime someday, they cannot force you to help government convict you of that crime by making you talk. So the Fifth Amendment guarantees freedom from self-incrimination. When it comes to the Fifth Amendment, the most important case in U.S. history, which is a case that you don't have to be familiar with the facts of, but you need to know the precedent, is Miranda versus Arizona. It involves this man right here. His name is Ernesto Miranda. Ernesto Miranda was a poor person. He was very uneducated. He raped and killed a 19-year-old girl. During his interrogation, um, the police back then, before Miranda versus Arizona, were not compelled to warn you of your rights, like your right to remain silent, guaranteed by the Fifth Amendment, and your right to a lawyer or counsel, guaranteed by the Sixth. During the interrogation, he confessed to the crime. He ends up confessing that he did kill and rape that little, uh, that 19-year-old girl. Um, when his lawyer eventually heard about what happened, he argued in the Supreme Court that Ernesto Miranda was forced to give up a right that he didn't even know he had. And therefore, his statements should not be admissible in the court of law. They should not be able to use his confession against Ernesto Miranda in court because he was forced to give up something he did not know he had. The Supreme Court agreed. And from then on, authorities are compelled to warn you about two of the guarantees of freedom in the U.S. Constitution's Bill of Rights. Number one, the Fifth Amendment's guaranteed to remain silent, your right to remain silent, and number two, your right to counsel. Forever on, we call these your Miranda rights or your Miranda warnings. That's why in police dramas and courtroom dramas, you always hear police officers, people when they're arresting somebody, warning them about their rights because if they're not if they don't give those rights, if they don't warn the suspect about those rights, whatever they say, statements made by a suspect, can be inadmissible. They cannot be admitted in the court of law. That's why today, police officers are compelled to warn them about these rights. Absent of these two warnings, statements made are inadmissible in the court of law. Anybody have any questions over that? So. The Supreme Court's reasoning is if, you, if the authorities do not give them or do not warn them about these two rights, they are trying to take that information away from a suspect illegally. And we talked about the exclusionary rule of the Fourth Amendment, how evidence seized legally cannot, are inadmissible in the court of law. Anyone have any questions over this? So, if you ever find yourself arrested someday, the police officers do not give you these Miranda warnings or Miranda rights. They don't read your Miranda rights. You can confess to the crime like Ernesto Miranda did. You can confess to 9-11 if you want to. They are not going to be able to use your statements against you in the court of law. However, there is one exception that you need to remember when it comes to the Miranda ruling. And this was established by the Supreme Court in New York versus Quarles. Again, not one of your required Supreme Court cases. All I want you to remember is the precedent. It set a public safety exception to the Miranda rules. In a grocery store somewhere, I think this is the facts of the case that you don't need to know about, a man raped a girl. The girl rushes out of the, the grocery store and sees a police officer, and she tells the police officer, the man has a gun. Go inside, the man has a gun. The police officer goes inside, and he sees the person, the suspect, and he asks him, where is the gun? 
the suspect said, it's over there. And indeed, he did hide the gun over there because he was scared that he was going to get caught. After all is said and done, after he gets arrested, his lawyer argued in court that since he was not read his Miranda rights, his right to remain silent, his right to a lawyer, statements made, and the evidence that they found because of his statement, which is the gun in this case, should be inadmissible in the court of law because the Miranda ruling should apply here. Everybody good with me so far? Yeah. All right. So here's what the Supreme Court said. If the authorities ask a suspect a question when public safety is at stake, like in this case, people could die. There's a gun. So if authorities ask a question that concerns public safety, statements made by the suspect are admissible even without the Miranda warnings. So they can still use the statement and the evidence they found because of the statement against him in the court of law. Again, this is another example of the Supreme Court trying to balance public safety with civil liberties. And in this case, they said there's a good enough reason here um, to go against the Miranda ruling, the concern for public safety. Yes, so the right to a lawyer and like direct silent just came out of because of rapists, they didn't want to confess. Like, exactly. Oh, well, if you're curious, you know, Miranda was still convicted of the crime. They just couldn't use his confession against him. Yeah. yeah, they had to use other evidences against him. That's not something you need to remember. Just remember um, the facts of the cases that you need to remember are the ones that are required, like our next one. The Sixth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is another important um, amendment when it comes to the rights of the accused. It guarantees multiple things for the accused, like the right to a speedy and public trial, the right to an impartial jury, But today, our main focus regarding the Sixth Amendment is the right to a counsel. The right to a counsel, the right to a lawyer. The Supreme Court, oh, I'm sorry, this Bill of Rights of the U.S. Constitution, Sixth Amendment guarantees the right to a lawyer, the right to an attorney for someone who is suspected of a wrongdoing. All right, one of the most important cases, probably the most important cases when it comes to the Sixth Amendment that involves the Sixth Amendment's right to a counsel is one of your required cases in AP government and that is Gideon versus Wainwright. And Gideon versus Wainwright, a homeless man, an indigent, named Clarence Gideon, Gideon, was accused of breaking and entering into a building. Being homeless and uneducated and poor, he goes to uh, and asks the state of Florida where he was accused of a crime, breaking and entering for a lawyer. At the time, like in Miranda versus Arizona, at this time, states were not compelled to provide the accused lawyers. The Sixth Amendment only applied to the federal government for federal crimes, but it did not apply to the state and local governments yet. In the state of Florida, they only afforded lawyers to people who are accused of capital crimes, crimes that you can be put on death row for, not for breaking and entering like what um, Gideon, versus, uh, Gideon was accused of. So again, he asked the state of Florida for a lawyer because he didn't feel like he can defend himself adequately. The state of Florida at the time, like in other states around the, the country, were not compelled to provide suspects lawyers or people who are being tried lawyers or attorneys. So he tries to defend himself as best as he could in state court, but Inevitably, he loses and gets sentenced to five years in jail. In jail, he starts reading about the Constitution of the United States. He starts getting himself educated, and he sees the Sixth Amendment. The Sixth Amendment says you have the right to a counsel. It doesn't say you have the right to a counsel if you can afford one. It doesn't say you have the right to a counsel if you have money, if you have economic needs. It just says you have the right to a counsel. And for Gideon, that meant you have an absolute right to a counsel. He argued that the right to a counsel is a fundamental right. What are we about to talk about? What is he? Very good. What he's trying to get the Supreme Court to do is realize that the right to a counsel guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment is such an important right 
that it needs to be applied to the state and local governments as well, not just to the federal government. It needs to be guaranteed by state and local governments as well. We're about to talk about selective incorporation. Again, what allows for the guarantees of freedom and the Bill of Rights to be incorporated to the state and local governments? You need to be, you need to be sharp about this. What allows for selective incorporation? What justifies it? The due process clause of the 14th Amendment. The due process clause of the 14th Amendment compels state and local governments to guarantee you liberty, to guarantee you some of these rights and guarantees of freedom. Again, it's selective. The Supreme Court decides which one gets incorporated and which ones don't on a case-by-case -case basis. Selective incorporation, if you need a definition, is a process in which the guarantees of freedom and the Bill of Rights are applied or incorporated to the state and local government. So the fundamental question here is, does the Sixth Amendment's right to counsel guarantee to an attorney, does it apply to the state and local governments? Is it a fundamental enough right? And the Supreme Court said yes. The 14th Amendment's due process clause applies the right to counsel to the state and local governments. This is known as selective incorporation. Selective incorporation. Because of this man right here, people who are accused of a crime in state court are now afforded a lawyer even if they cannot afford one. Some of you in this class, God forbid, would benefit from this because not everybody can afford a lawyer. Lawyers are very expensive. No, the impact of this is states and local governments cannot deny you a lawyer. They have to provide you with one. Because that right, that guarantee of freedom, is now incorporated to the state and local governments. All right, this case is very similar to what other case that we talked about yesterday. They always put them together. What other case we talked about yesterday? We have two cases that we did with dealing with selective incorporation, where a guarantee of freedom was incorporated to the state and local governments. One of them is Gideon versus Wainwright, with the Sixth Amendment's guarantee the right to a counsel. What's the other one? McDonald versus Chicago, in which the Supreme Court um, guaranteed what to the state, um, to the state and local governments, bear arms. the right to bear arms, the individual's right to bear arms. So make sure. Well, in your head, you always pair those two cases up together. One is about the sixth, yes, and one is about the second, but they both deal with selective incorporation. A guarantee of freedom was applied to the state and local governments using the 14th Amendment's due process clause, the most important clause in this class. Any questions? All right, next we're gonna move on to the right to privacy. There have been debates in the United States about whether or not the right to privacy is guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States. The debate comes from the fact that the right to privacy is not mentioned at all in the Bill of Rights of the Constitution. The Bill of Rights of the Constitution does not explicitly say that you have the right to privacy. None of your amendments that we've talked about in class implies that you do have that right. But case after case in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said that we do indeed have the right to privacy. Even though it is not an explicit right, it is an implicit right. Your enumerated guarantees of freedom, the judge puts it this way, your enumerated guarantees of freedom are a light. And it casts a shadow. And these shadows are also guaranteed. So even though the right to privacy is not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution, multiple guarantees of freedom from your amendments guarantees that there's a zone of privacy that the government cannot penetrate. So what do I mean by that? Let's look, analyze some of your amendments. The Third Amendment to the Constitution of the United States says that government cannot force a stranger into your house. Does that imply privacy? Yeah. Yes, it does. The Fourth Amendment to the Constitution, no unreasonable searches and seizures. Government cannot take your property or search your property without probable cause. That implies privacy. The Fifth Amendment to the Constitution, you have the right to remain silent. If there's information that you don't want to reveal to the government, you do not have to. That implies privacy. The Ninth Amendment to the Constitution, how does that imply privacy? You got rights that are what? 
that are not enumerated, that are not mentioned. And the Supreme Court has interpreted the Ninth Amendment to also include the right to privacy. So all of these guarantees of freedom, including the first, but I'm not going to talk about the first because it's kind of complicated how they uh, cast this shadow, cast this zone of privacy. And not only that, not only that we do have the right to privacy that protects us from the federal government because of the 14th Amendment and the liberty guarantee of the 14th Amendment, just like the right to bear arms, just like the right to a counsel, the right to privacy also is applicable to who? The states. It also limits the state and local governments. So when it comes to the right to privacy, here's what you need to know. It's not, it's not explicit, it is implied, it's implicit. And it is also guaranteed against the states by the 14th Amendment's due process clause and the liberty guarantee of the due process clause. But whenever you come across the right to privacy case, remember the 14th Amendment, remember that it's not in the Constitution of the United States, but it is heavily implied according to the Supreme Court and decisions made by the Supreme Court. So the Due Process Clause and its liberty guarantee are is used by the court to extend the right to privacy to the state and local governments as well, to incorporate that right to the state and local governments. There have been many cases in the Supreme Court where this has been used to protect people's behavior away from government restriction and government limitation. Like there was a case about whether or not a family can homeschool their own kids, or whether or not you can watch pornography in your own house, or whether or not uh, a couple can use contraception without government limitation. All of these are protected, all these behaviors are protected by the right to privacy. So why do we care about the right to privacy? We're about to talk about one of the most controversial cases in U.S. history, one of the most contentious cases in U.S. history. Even today, this is hotly debated. Roe versus Wade. In almost all the states in the Union, before Roe versus Wade, abortion was not legal, including in our state, the state of Texas. There have been state laws that have banned a woman from having an abortion. In the state of Texas, it was illegal for a woman to have an abortion unless it is done to save her life. Jane Roe decided to challenge that, um, that policy, that law, and had an abortion anyway. So, Roe versus Wade happened here, guys. It happened in Texas. It concerns a Texas law that banned abortion. We don't use her real name, but this is her real name, Norma McCorvey. Jane Roe is not her real name. They know how controversial this case is going to be, so they try to keep her name a secret, because I know this is a very hotly debated issue. So in this case, there's two things that are uh, at odds. The argument that the abortion side will put forth is that the right, a woman's body is something that is private, that the government should not be able to control. What a woman wants to do with her own body, including the early termination of a pregnancy, should be protected by the right to privacy. And remember, before this case, the Supreme Court already indeed said that the Constitution of the United States does protect the right to privacy. All the abortion advocates want is to extend that right to privacy, not just to homeschooling, not just to watching porn, not just to doing, uh, taking contraceptions, but abortion as well. The right of a woman to terminate her own pregnancy. So they believe that the right to privacy should extend to abortions and should protect a woman's right to choose from government limitations and government restrictions. Essentially saying that that Texas law and all those laws that ban abortion in the United States were unconstitutional, they were a violation of a woman's privacy and her right to control her own body. Whether or not you buy that argument or not, that's up to you. All right, so there's two things that are odd here. The right to privacy, a woman's right to control what happens with her own body, versus the health of the, the, the state's interest to protect the mother's life and to protect the life, whether or not you think it's a life, of the fetus that sits inside. 
But here's what the, the fundamental question here is. Does the right to privacy extend to abortion? Does the right to privacy extend to abortion? Can a government tell a woman what to do with her own body in regards to abortion? Or is that protected by the right to privacy? Here's what the Supreme Court said, and this is a big victory for abortion advocates everywhere in the United States. Woman's right to abortion is protected from the states by the right to privacy. They use the 14th Amendment's due process clause and the liberty guarantee in the due process clause to rule in favor of abortion. That the right to privacy, through the 14th Amendment's due process clause and its liberty guarantee, applies to the states as well and applies to abortion. However, guys, this is not a complete protection, and this is something that you should remember. When they decided on Roe versus Wade, they did not protect abortion completely all throughout the stages of a pregnancy. They kind of titter-tatter um, between fences. It's still a victory for abortion advocates, but it's not a complete protection of abortion. A woman's pregnancy is usually divided into three. How long does a, usual, a woman's pregnancy usually take? 40 weeks? Nine months. You say 40 years? 40 weeks. Oh, years. Nine months. Um, that, those nine months are divided into three. The first three months is the first trimester. The second three months is the second trimester. And the last three months is the third trimester. This absolute protection on abortion that the right to privacy protects, according to the Supreme Court, only lasts until the first trimester of a pregnancy. Now, the second trimester, the third trimester, there could be some restrictions that are made to protect the woman's life or to protect the right of uh, the life of the fetus. So in the second trimester, some state restrictions can be imposed. States can make it harder for a woman to have an abortion during the second trimester. In some states, they make you go to counseling first. Or in the state of Texas, there was a law that made women look at their ultrasound before they're able to have an abortion, discouraging them from having it in the first place. In the third trimester, in those last three months, these are called late-term pregnancies, the Supreme Court allowed a complete ban on abortion. So states can outright just ban abortion in those last three months of a pregnancy because for the Supreme Court, that's already too late, so states are given the choice whether or not to allow it or not to allow it. So there are some states that have late-term abortions, like New York, for example, you can wait until those last few months of a pregnancy, you can have an abortion legally, but there are, most states don't allow abortion in those last three months, including our state, the state of Texas. Anyone have any questions here? So, the impact, it legalized abortion in the United States. All those laws that banned abortion in the United States across the country were struck down. But it did strike a balance between privacy rights for women and the government's interest to preserve the life to protect the unborn or the life of the unborn. Alright. Now there's a lot of controversy surrounding Roe versus Wade. Um, in every case, guys, there is a majority and a minority. Um, like, for example, in, in Roe versus Wade, it's a 7-2 decision, which means seven of the justices out of the nine justices of the Supreme Court agreed with the decision, and two did not. How many of the justices must agree on a decision for a decision to be made by a court? The majority. Simple majority. Five out of the nine have to agree. In this case, they had a sizable majority. One of the justices in that in that are part of the decision, that are part of the majority, will be tasked, will have the responsibility of writing down what we call the majority opinion. The majority opinion is very important because what it does, it's like an essay, where the Supreme Court um, lays down the reasoning behind the decision. Why did the, why, why did the Supreme Court decide the way that they did? They give them reasons. Again, most of those reasons have to come from where? The Constitution. Because a lot of their reasoning should be based on the Constitution of the United States. A lot of them are based on the Federalist Papers. What else can you use to justify your decision as a judge? The Constitution, the Federalist Papers, what else is a good one? Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights is in the Constitution, yes. 
What else? Sorry? Amendment. Anything that is in the Constitution, sorry? Quorum past court cases. Precedents established by past court cases that have similar, um, that involve similar issues. All right. One of the justices who is not part of the decision, or all of them, who don't agree with their fellow justices, they can write what we call a dissenting opinion. A dissenting opinion is why the justices did not agree with their fellow justices. What are their reasoning why they did not support the court's decision? Both of these guys are broken down, analyzed by law students around the United States. Because again, these opinions are written down because you can use them on a future case. Hey, this is what the Supreme Court decided, and this is their reasoning. This is what I'm going to be using in this case that is very similar. That's why these opinions are very important. Those of you that are going to get into law, you're going to read hundreds of these. Because you can borrow those reasoning and use it in your own arguments. All right. This is the only case where AP wants you to remember why did they disagree? What was the dissent? These two justices were the ones that did not agree with the court's decision. Justice White and Justice Rehnquist, I need you to remember why they did not agree with the Supreme Court's decision. Justice White believed what the Supreme Court was doing here is exercising raw judicial power. Raw judicial power. What he believed his fellow justice, what he accused his fellow justices of doing is, before they even received this case, before they even took time to take a look at the facts, they already had an agenda. The agenda was to legalize abortion in the United States. And they used their judicial power in order to achieve that agenda. Instead of doing what the court is supposed to be doing, which would be the interpreter of the Constitution, deferring to the policymakers in this case, playing the role of referee instead of somebody that promotes an agenda. What he wanted was for the court to defer to the elected state governments. Let them make that decision. The issue about abortion should not be left to the courts. It should be left to the elected officials in each one of the state governments. If the state government wants to ban abortion, we should allow them to do so. If they don't, we should allow them to do so. It should be their choice. This decision is so important that it should be the choice of those who are elected into their state governments, not us. We believe the Supreme Court does not have the authority to make such an important decision. We should defer to the people who are elected, the people who are chosen. Not us. This shouldn't be our decision. This shouldn't be left up to us. If the states want to ban it, then let them ban it. If they don't, then don't. What is he accusing his fellow justices of doing? What are they? What are they? Very good. He's accusing his fellow justices of practicing activism. Hey, you had a goal. Use your power incorrectly to achieve that goal. We should have deferred to the state governments. If Texas wants to ban abortion, then allow Texas to ban abortion. This is not our place to decide for Texas. All right. Justice Rehnquist's dissent is this. In this case, the 14th Amendment, oh, by the way, this is important on your exams. Roe versus Wade, remember, the 14th Amendment guarantees the right to privacy even against the state and local governments. This was used to legalize abortion in Roe versus Wade. So whenever they ask you, hey, what's the clause involved in Roe versus Wade? 14th Amendment's due process clause. Specifically, it's liberty guaranteed. Here's Reichwitz's um, dissent. He said, hey, the 14th Amendment was added 100 years ago after the Civil War in the 1860s. Anti-abortion laws have existed all across that time, between the 1860s and when Roe versus Wade was decided. I think this was in the 1980s. 
anti-abortion laws have existed throughout that time. How come no Supreme Court before ours have decided to use the 14th Amendment's due process clause to strike down these abortion laws? It could only mean the 14th Amendment was not meant to strike down abortion, was not meant to protect, I'm sorry, was not meant to strike down abortion laws or anti-abortion laws. It was not meant to protect abortion. Because throughout the years of American history, a hundred years has passed since the 14th Amendment was added. We're the first court to rule in favor of abortion using the 14th Amendment to the Constitution and the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. So he's saying, hey, look at the past. We've had the 14th Amendment for a hundred years in this country. Never has it, has it been used to strike down anti-abortion laws. So he's saying court presidents on abortion have allowed state restrictions despite the existence of the 14th Amendment for a hundred years. So what is he doing? He's looking at precedent, right? He's looking at the past, looking at what the Supreme Court has decided. And never have they decided to strike down abortion laws or anti-abortion laws using the 14th Amendment. So what is he practicing here? Restraint. Alright, after Roe versus Wade, guys, the Supreme Court has allowed more restrictions on abortion. It has allowed more restrictions. Roe versus Wade was a big victory for, for abortion groups in the United States, but subsequent court rulings regarding abortion has allowed more restrictions on abortion, has allowed more state restrictions. Right now, we talked about the Texas abortion law, the heartbeat bill that seeks to challenge the precedent of Roe versus Wade because that bill could restrict a woman's right to choose during that third trimester where abortion is supposedly completely protected by the right to privacy. And I guarantee you, these opinions made by these justices are going to be used by the people arguing for one side or the other. The dissenting opinion will be used by the people that want to protect that Texas law. And the people, the, the majority opinion or the, the court's opinion will be used by the people that want to support abortion, that want to protect this precedent. Oh, by the way, how come the Supreme Court, after Roe vs. Wade, allowed more restrictions? Did the court change its mind? After Roe vs. Wade, did these justices change their mind about abortion suddenly? No. Very good. The ideology changed because new justices and judges are being added to the courts. Some, some die, some retire, and new ones get added, and the composition of the courts change. So the dominant ideology in the court system also changed. All right, we don't have a lot of time, I realize. But on AP Classroom, you have a quiz that you can take to exempt your assignments for today. You have two assignments today, 3.4 and 3.5. I'll get you, let's do an 80. You get an 80, you're exempted. Try to hurry, please. We don't have a lot of time, guys. I do apologize. But again, if you don't get the grade that you want, just go ahead and do the assignment.